Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to what should be an absolutely fascinating panel. Uh, my name is Gideon Rose. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs, and I have the distinct privilege and pleasure of uh, moderating, of herding these, these incredibly uh, impressive cats over here uh, to my right uh, in a discussion on fragility, conflict, and humanitarianism. Uh, we have a spectacular group here, um, and I'll just sort of go through them. Uh, we have uh, <coughs> Nancy Lindbergh, who's president of the USIP, uh, who has served uh, uh, in a number of positions uh, at uh, USAID um, and uh, at Mercy Corps and elsewhere. Uh, we have Elizabeth Cousins, who's the deputy chief executive officer of the UN Foundation, who's also served uh, as uh, ambassador to the UN Economic and Social Council uh, and as an rep alternate representative to the General Assembly uh, and was also at uh, USUN. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, David Miliband, uh, former foreign minister of Great Britain, who is now the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Uh, we have Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs um, and uh, has had a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service. I think it's fair to say that what distinguishes all of our panelists is not just their intelligence and deep concern for humanitarian issues, but their range of experience, practical and intellectual, uh, in grappling with complex emergencies and complex humanitarian crises from a number of different perspectives, uh, inside governments, uh, inside international organizations, uh, in the NGO sector. Um, and the, the sad truth is that when the more one learns about the kinds of problems that uh, exist in the humanitarian sphere uh, these days, the more one uh, uh, realizes how difficult they are to solve and how great the, the need is uh, to try. And so we are lucky to have them with us, uh, have them with us today to help discuss these questions. Let me start by uh, addressing the question of fragility. So let's do a little, simple little terminological question. Is fragility the new failed state? Uh, is, is there something, is this just a PC term uh, for uh, states in crisis or states in trouble or failed states? Uh, who wants to tackle uh, what fragility means since it seems to be the new term of art in the field? Let me start since um, I think I'm on. Uh, since I looked at this list of the top 10 fragile states and six of them are uh, in Africa, uh, but yet, if we look across Africa and we look at fragile states, they're not all failed states. So I don't think fragility is a new term for failed states, but it's a description of where states are and what, uh, what kinds of abilities they have to respond to crisis. So that you know in a fragile state, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the development is not there to respond to a crisis. And these are the kinds of states that we need to be concerned about in terms of building their capacity, uh, giving them strength, because fragility, fragility uh, implies weakness. Uh, so helping them uh, build their strength so that in a situation of crisis, they're able to respond. Uh, they're prepared to respond. Uh, they have the institutions, the infrastructure, the capacity to respond to a crisis that they might not be able to respond to uh, in the current conditions that they are in. Yeah, I, I would just build on that by saying, um, first of all, I think there isn't a shared, deeply defined understanding across a lot of different actors as to what fragility really means. Um, where I think we see it as the most useful definition is when it's both weak and ineffective and also illegitimate in the eyes of its citizens. What we're seeing in places that aren't in Africa, uh, but places like Syria, for example, where you had a middle-income country uh, that has now lost almost 60 years of development gains in five years of conflict is where you have illegitimacy that, at, that is a critical part of fragility. And so as we look at how to make this a usable term, there does need to be a greater understanding across um, a broader set of institutions as 
uh, as to what are the indicators of fragility in both of those d domains, both legitimacy and effectiveness, and how to use those indicators in a way that prompts useful action. I think that, uh, from my point of view, there's an additional element in the debate about what a fragile state is, which is that historically it's been about the capacity of government to meet basic needs and to uh, withstand external shocks. I think the additional element, if you look at how the OECD and others are, are defining fragility, is that they are consumed by internal violence. And I think that the aspect of internal cohesion and internal uh, coherence is now an additional element in the fragile state uh, lexicon. Because what we're seeing with 30 odd civil wars going on around the world at the moment is states that are imploding as well as states that are suffering from external shocks. And I think if we have that lens, we understand that fragility encompasses a notion of crisis as well. And that seems to me to be very important at the moment. I just add one point, which is uh, there have been many generations of effort to try to get common definitions. And I think I, I just would underscore um, Nancy's call to do more to try to get commonality across not just definitions, but the data that underpins it. And the one thing that I think is widely recognized and really a significant challenge in this sphere is the paucity of data in these contexts. There are such significant, <coughs> significant data gaps. Uh, that really need to be filled in, e in order to understand precisely the kind of conditions and vulnerabilities that, uh, that we're talking about. A century and change ago, the organizations or the states that are represented here would have been grappling with these areas of the world uh, and these kinds of problems through the prism of colonialism. Uh, half a century ago, uh, they would have been grappling with them through sort of Cold War jockeying of propping up sort of brutal dictators in a sort of uh, uh, our own despot versus the other guy's despot. Um, now, having sort of uh, lost the taste for colonialism and direct control, having uh, no real need for the, the geopolitical jockeying, they seem to have lost interest in these areas in general and bequeathed them to the humanitarian community, both uh, international, uh, subnational, and, and in the humanitarian departments of their own uh, uh, governments. Uh, is this sort of a progress, or, or is it a sort of a sign that no one really cares about these areas because they're not strategic prizes enough to be the centerpiece of mainstream state action like in the past? Uh, let me start with the 50 years ago, because if you uh, look back, there's an interesting article that was written in January 1957 by John Kennedy, and it was after the uh, election, the re-election of President Eisenhower. And John Kennedy had spent the early 1950s touring the world, actually. Um, he'd been to Southeast Asia, he'd been to the Middle East, and he came back and he, he wrote this piece, um, uh, it was entitled, A Democrat Thinks About Foreign Policy. I think it was in Foreign Affairs, actually. Uh, the, the, uh, and he said there were two great trends that define, that would define the second half of the 20th century. Uh, trend number one was the drive for independence. Uh, this was partly fueled by some time that he'd spent uh, in Algeria. He was appalled at uh, the w way the French were engaging in uh, Algeria. It was also, um, he, he, uh, it was interesting given what happened in Vietnam later. But anyway, if, uh, trend number one was about independence. And trend number two was integration. And he saw in the European, in then what was called the European Economic Community, uh, but he saw elsewhere a great trend towards integration. Now what's uh, extraordinary is that the drive for independence was clearly a successful one and decolonization or independence was a defining feature really of the 1950s and uh, 60s. But now, uh, between 20 and 30 of the states that became independent are actually imploding. So you've got disintegration in the states that were independent. And the moves towards integration that he foresaw have evidently stalled uh, because the global system is far more defined by fragmentation than it is by political integration. You could say that there's economic integration, but there isn't uh, political integration. And so it seems to me that what we're struggling with or what we're uh, facing now is not trends of independence on the one hand, integration on the other. You're, you're finding a minority of states that are disintegrating, which picks up your failing states. And on the other hand, you don't have the ordering that came out of the Cold War. 
And it's, no one should obviously be um, nostalgic for the Cold War, but it did provide some order to the global system. And in the sort of places where IRC is evident, the lack of order is evident. Uh, but it's also the case that while you don't have colonial relationships, you do have regional proxies that are fighting out, notably in Syria, which, um, which Nancy mentioned. And I think that's the uh, sort of lack of leadership that is, uh, or, or the loss of uh, leadership that's evident. And so there isn't an international bulwark against the kind of disintegration that we see around the world at the moment. Can I jump in here? I think one thing we have to be very careful about, though, is creating the impression that there are sort of two universes, one of fragile, failing, disintegrating states on the one hand uh, and the other not. I think it's a much more variegated reality. You have countries who've been through searing conflict and deep poverty and managed to do re make remarkable strides. I think about a country like Rwanda, for example, or a country like Ethiopia. There are so many different kinds of trajectories that countries who've experienced very deep conflict and very embedded poverty, uh, uh, deep legacies of colonialism, etc., have managed to uh, grapple with uh, and overcome. Uh, there also are the opposite stories, but I think we have to be very granular in looking at specific contexts. The other point that I would, uh, uh, I think, make, it's not just humanitarian instruments and actors who are deployed in these contexts. There are peacekeepers, there are mediators, there are diplomats. There's a wide range of actors, capitals, who are very engaged in countries that are not seen as peripheral at all. I think the challenge is that the tools that we have in our mainline institutions, whether they're diplomatic tools or development tools or humanitarian tools, still are probably not quite geared well enough and acutely enough to engage in some of these most difficult uh, uh, cases. And so that's where, to me, the kind of cutting edge of innovation and thinking really needs to be about what we need to do next to be more effective. And, and I think you've really hit a key point here, Elizabeth, and that is, so currently about 30% of our overseas development assistance goes to countries that are considered uh, weak or fragile. And that is um, out of, you know, there are about 50 that are, that are classified loosely by the various indices as fragile. Um, not all of them are low income, some of them are middle income, but on that list, about 30% of our overseas development assistance. For the last 20 plus years, our development paradigms have been very focused on investing in growth. And they have not been focused on looking at how to ensure that growth is accompanied by the kind of governance structures that are inclusive, that are effective, uh, and accountable and that focus on state society relationships. Um, and so what you get are, over and over again, like Syria, uh, you get investment, or choose a country that, like Rwanda, or um, we just saw with Sierra Leone, where you get your investments washed away because the state isn't strong enough to either manage the conflict or withstand the natural disaster. I mean, Sierra Leone, I think, is a really good example of what you're talking about, Elizabeth, where it actually did finally start to be uh, emergent from a very vicious civil war, and then it got slammed by Ebola because its systems were just not strong enough yet. We really need to refocus our development tools to be a companion to our humanitarian investments so that we don't keep losing those development investments uh, because of the cycles these countries go through. And I would just add that the important uh, component of this is resilience, uh, that we help, we use humanitarian assistance to help countries uh, who are, are in crisis. But the resiliency that is needed for them to withstand the next crisis uh, is not there. And so I, I like to use the analogy that we race the, the ball to the goal, but we never kick it uh, to score the point. Uh, because there's another crisis and we're running back to get another ball and in the meantime uh, uh, the goalie of, of that country is not able to withstand the power and then it gets pushed back. So we're constantly rerunning uh, uh, our assistance programs to deal with crisis because we never get our countries across the goal line. Okay, so let's press this because um, one of the 
interesting challenges, of course, is to go from humanitarianism and crisis relief to development, uh, to uh, from from dealing with the conflict to preventing it to to building the institutions that uh, can have or can foster sort of stable, secure environments that can provide more autonomous growth and 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 healthy societies. But we seem very, uh, how should we say, uh, unable to actually generate that kind of institutional development in other countries. And is that because we don't have the tools, as you were saying, Elizabeth, or is it because it's just really, really hard to do? In other words, providing relief, if you, if you give enough aid, you can provide a bed for the night, you can provide an aid package, you can provide a medicine, but generating a healthy institutional development inside a country that doesn't have it, uh, is that a problem with our, the scale of our efforts or just the nature uh, and the ability of the, the, the challenge? I'm there. happy to jump in. No, sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Afan. Okay. Um, you know, first, I think it is important to recognize it is really, really hard. It is really complicated and it's very hard as outsiders, frankly, to do certain things in other people's contexts. I think one has to be very mindful of, of the authenticity of institutional development and, uh, uh, and, and growth. But I would just point to three things that I think we need to really get to grips with and when we think about uh, tools. <clears throat> the one, one is the issue of risk and how to be more risk tolerant in the way we think about development assistance in particular. Um, the second is the issue of time frame, how to be more patient about time frames because institutional change uh, and development takes time. Uh, it has in every single one of our countries. Uh, and the third is context sensitivity. Uh, and I think that's a very challenging one um, and it varies from uh, situation to situation, but I think it's something that uh, requires a whole range of in tools from intelligence tools to different ways of thinking about diplomacy and assistance uh, in order to develop uh, those kinds of responsive uh, uh, kind of antennae in, in these kinds of contexts. And, and I would add a couple to that list. Um, and the first is I think there has been a shift in how we understand the goal. And for a number of years, we all talked about building strong and effective institutions, but as if they were isolated from the societies that they served. And so the shift has been more a talk about state-society relationships as a way to understand effectiveness of, of institutions. The second is, um, you know, when I was at AID, the drought hit Kenya. You know what I'm going to say. We finally assembled data for the first time to Elizabeth's point that the data sets are not actually what we need and learned that year after year, half a billion dollars of humanitarian assistance was going into the north arid dry lands of Kenya while all the development assistance went to the south, the productive south. So we need to shift so that between our uh, development, relief, our diplomats and our security sector people that we have a shared understanding of what is the problem that we're trying to solve so that we're building the kind of institutions that grapple with the risks that are inherent in a particular context. Can I just follow that because I think all three of my panelists, co-panelists have made really great points but if you link the two parts of the discussion so far, the dis part of the discussion about fragility and then the part of the discussion that's lapsed into the discussion of humanitarian and development assistance. It strikes me that the, the terminology as well as the institutions that we use are not fit for purpose for the fragile states that we're talking about. I mean, even the discussion of humanitarian on the one side and developmental assistance on the other. The implication of the fragile state analysis is that the division doesn't make sense. That the idea that there, uh, at the moment, I think I'm right in saying about $6 billion a year is spent in the top 20 fragile states on humanitarian assistance and about $25 billion a year on humanitarian assistance, on development assistance in the same countries. But they're spent through different institutions, through different timelines, different actors, and that doesn't make sense for all of the countries that have been mentioned, Kenya example, Ethiopia example, even the Rwanda example. The humanitarian versus development uh, paradigm doesn't really work. And that you, you can see that followed through on an institutional level. If you think about, you know, the UNHCR is struggling today with the fact that it has a refugee mandate, but two-thirds of displaced people around the world are, are internally displaced people, not actually refugees. And so I think that the implications of what all three panelists have said are actually pretty profound for the way in which we conceive the purpose and the institutions and the organization of the project that we're engaged with. So let me, 
I mean, you, you, all of you guys have experience with different institutions. They're not only different facets of the problems, they're different um, organizational routes to getting at them. So what is the proper role of, let's say, the NGO sector? What is the proper role of the national uh, policy uh, sector? What is the role of the international sector? And is there some ability to coordinate those various mechanisms? I mean, we were just watching the Ebola crisis play out last year, and one of the notable things uh, of that crisis was just how dysfunctional and, dis and uncoordinated uh, the, the response was across the board. Um, and it, is there any kind of hope when all the different people from different sectors are going about their own tasks in their own ways without any kind of overarching coordination? If I could just start in, in thinking about the Ebola crisis, one of the elements that, and in any crisis that we have, one of the important elements that we tend to forget is the country and the government and their ability to harness all of the uh, activities of organizations that want to come in and help. Uh, in some countries, there is a huge uh, and strong willingness. They invite uh, the countries in. Some of them have capacity. If they don't, they seek it. Uh, in those places, it works uh, because they're welcoming the support. In other places, it's almost as if humanitarian assistance is an imposition on a country. And so working with those governments and getting those governments to buy in to the support mechanisms and tools that are being provided to them uh, becomes a, a huge challenge. And we have to figure out how to bring governments into this process and bring the people of the country into the process. We can't impose help on people. Uh, so you look at the case of Liberia, uh, where you had a willing partner, a willing government that welcomed uh, the international community with open arms, uh, and it's worked. And then you look at Guinea, where the international community was not so welcome. Uh, they were approached with a bit of skepticism and, and a lack of confidence, and we're still trying to make that process of dealing with Ebola in that country work. So let me press you on that. Does, does that, is the suggestion there or the implication that successful aid requires what in the military we'd call a sort of permissive environment? I think you need some of, of that to be successful. If you don't have a willing partner in the government, it's going to be harder. It might work, but it's going to be harder. So if I, it, it, building on that and following on David's comment, you know, it, it, it's, there's a um, humanitarian action has, you know, builds on hum, international humanitarian law, has very specific principles that enable humanitarian actors um, to go in and not work with a government, especially important in conflict environments and especially important when you don't have a willing partner but you have uh, an urgent mandate to save lives. Where I think that has become complex and really deserves a serious revisiting is, first of all, you know, if you look at the example of Haiti, where after the earthquake, NGOs got slammed for having created a, an equally dysfunctional, totally parallel system that hadn't advanced the development of that country. Um, and all kinds of accusations flew around that. The, the challenge is, how do you respond in a way that uses often that enormous flow of resources that doesn't otherwise come into a country for the purpose of building a, a more sustained peace or a more sustained resilience. It's easier to do in a country where you have a willing partner, where there is an active conflict, and where you are not, as an NGO, associating with a very corrupt or predatory government. It's very difficult to do in places where you do have conflict and, and a predatory government. And so the question is, can new paradigms like the New Deal for engagement in fragile states, the whole grouping of countries that have taken on the fragile label, have pledged themselves to a framework of moving out of conflict through legitimate politics, accountable institutions, et cetera, does that offer an opportunity for NGOs to work in conflict with at least the commitments of the government, even if they don't always follow that through. This, this is going to be a big conversation over the next, I think, few years as we try to sort out 
how do you move into this new era of addressing fragility, uh, especially as we get into the sustainable development goals? Uh, can I follow that and uh, ask a question of, uh, of ourselves and, and see what, my, what others think? But if we make it very practical, think of a country like South Sudan, which in a way embodies, it, it's not the high politics of Syria, and, but, but it's 10 million people, eight and a half million of them in humanitarian... Disaster and conflict. Yeah, so eight and a half million of them in humanitarian need, the world's newest nation, 99% support for independence after a terrible civil war. Within three years, it's uh, imploding in a, in, a, in a terrible way. Um, it precisely doesn't have the kind of well-functioning government that would create not just a permissive environment, but an enabling environment. Uh, it's got massive splits in part of the country. It's got enormous resources that compound the problem in various ways. And I think it's an interesting test case for both the potential of the international community to make a difference, but also the limits of it. The one, I'm much newer to the humanitarian sector than, than my co-panelists, but one thing that has struck me in the last 18 months is the incredible sense of shared mission in places like South Sudan. Whenever I do a public meeting, I get asked, aren't the NGOs and the international community falling over each other, turning up in the same village with the same, to do the same things? No, they're not. There is actually a localized coordination of a quite impressive kind. But it's not allied to any kind of medium-term plan that could really uh, present a coherent vision for the future of South Sudan. Why? Because we're all enslaved in various ways to local feuding that we don't actually have the power to change. And I think that's the unpermissive environment that is, is very, very sobering when you think about eight and a half million people in need. And I mean, all of you here are, are, have real expertise in, in Africa. And I think it's worth trying to think, well, how does Gideon's question take practical form in somewhere like South Sudan? Let me actually ask Ambassador Thomas Greenfield. I mean, we've just seen with this whole FIFA scandal, the United States going in and in effect trying to clean up an international organization uh, uh, that is sort of in some ways entirely beyond American borders that we are not per only peripherally related to. We didn't even care much about soccer until very recently. Um, is the U.S. as not just the sort of dominant military power on the globe, but often the largest contributor in a variety of uh, these kinds of environments uh, in terms of aid and with a lot of personnel and so forth and a lot of capabilities uh, and the home of a lot of the NGOs involved, can the U.S provide the sort of coordinating function that seems to be necessary? Because if we don't do it, will anybody else do it? We can't do it alone. Uh, I think it's very clear when we look at uh, situations, in, even in, in, um, in, as you mentioned in South Sudan, we have to work with other partners. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to work with the region. Uh, we have to work with the UN, and we have to work with the broader international community. Uh, we don't have the capacity by ourselves to make this work. We have the will. Uh, we have a lot of the resources and tools to contribute to that, this, uh, to be a catalyst for change, a catalyst for leadership. But I think it's important to have the, the buy-in of uh, the entire international community and all of our partners. So it's important that we work with the EU, we work with the Europeans, we work with the African Union, the UN, uh, regional uh, uh, countries that are impacted by a crisis so that it's not seen first as a US problem and secondly as a US failure if it's not, uh, if it's not successful. Can I just add one sure. point to this? I mean, there, are, uh, there is a whole cottage industry of coordination mechanisms and forms and lessons learned and things like that. And, and in many cases, it actually works quite well, particularly in the humanitarian arena, in others less well. Um, but I think at the, at the fundamental level, what really is often the difficulty is the question of the strategy. What is the problem? Is there a shared definition of what the core problem is across all of the stakeholders that Ambassador Greenfield just mentioned? 
Uh, is there uh, then a kind of shared analysis of what it will take to grapple with the problem? And then the coordination challenges tend to sort themselves out if there's clarity about that. But getting to that is really, I think, some of the conundrum and how we harness the strategic thinking within the various institutions who are at play uh, in these contexts, whether it's the UN, whether it's the international financial institutions, the regional actors who are so critical, and the country uh, leadership themselves um, is, is, is really, I think, at the nut of it. Okay, so answer your own question. How do we get to that point? How do we get <laughs> past that? If we were to try to get agreement on a strategy in this group with a general group group and an open discussion, uh, we would, uh, and, a, and a one person, one vote uh, discussion, we would never, uh, no strategy would emerge from this discussion if we, uh, uh, without a sort of very strong moderator or somebody laying down the law or whatever. So uh, how, is what you just said a problem that will never be solved? No, I think you can solve it at times, partially. You're, op you're talking about contexts where information deficits are significant, but I think we're rapidly filling them in a variety of ways. So I do think sort of evidence and data are an important part of the question. And then creating platforms for very open debate uh, of a variety of kinds about the issues that are at stake are, are a big part of getting to at least a point where you can clarify relevant differences so that you can have a more constructive debate. People and institutions will have different points of view, they'll have different interests, that's fine. Um, but there are ways, I think, of handling that productively. And I think part of the answer is in the openness of the debate we have about the context we're talking about. And, and I just wanted to, you brought up Ebola and Elizabeth's list of what needs to happen to get to an, an effective strategy completely defines the challenges around Ebola. I mean, it started with a dysfunctioning institution, WHO, who was slow to ring the bells and bring everybody in. But then there was an utter lack of data because in those three West African countries, they did not have the surveillance data that told us exactly what was going on. And then there was a disagreement about strategy. Was it medical or behavior? Once those pieces, came together, we really had a fairly rapid, effective response that put Liberia and Sierra Leone especially back on a very fast path to recovery. What I think we're, what we're seeing right now is, is um, we came together as a global community around the Millennium Development Goals and made a lot of progress with a shared understanding, a shared data, and moved ahead. What, what that didn't give us were some of the critical shared data points and discussion platforms and articulated goals of how to address with how to address these fundamental issues of conflict and fragility and that's what is importantly being addressed in the S in, in, in the redo effort around the SDGs. I want to get to the SDGs. One second, David wants to jump uh, in. Uh, here. The, the, I'm, um, there's too much violent agreement on this panel, okay. so I, 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 I want to I want to um, come in on two things. One is we have a very very different reading on Ebola than the general sense that's come over so far. And secondly, I, I, although it might be very undiplomatic, I might venture something about American leadership and how it fits into the wider questions. But on, the, on, on Ebola, I mean, I would add very, very strongly in the diagnostic of what happened that in 2014, in the first half of 2014, there was deep, deep, deep resistance in the governments of Sierra Leone and Liberia to admit that there was an Ebola crisis of very serious proportions. Uh, the lateness in the game wasn't simply an international community WHO response problem, as um, has been said, which was part of the problem, but there was also deep resistance in the country. Secondly, our reading is that the international focus on expensive secondary care on medical treatment, billions of dollars pledged to emergency medical centers. Those centers never got built. Those that did get built didn't get staffed. Those that were staffed didn't actually have people reporting to them. When I was in Liberia, people didn't dare go to the emergency treatment centers because they knew that if they died, they'd be cremated and there'd be no way for their relatives to come and recognize their bodies. There was a huge political um, uh, chasm between the authorities, national and international, and uh, the people. So, there was, so th from our reading, it wasn't the focus on secondary care that made the difference. Thirdly, in the end, what beat back Ebola was community response. It was, in the two provinces that we work in most, Kenema province in 
uh, Sierra Leone and Lofa province in, in Liberia, 200,000 uh, people each or so in each community. It wasn't the emergency care centers. What happened was that community mobilization crossed the chasm of distrust so that people did real, realize that the posters that were up or the billboards that were around the country saying Ebola kills were actually speaking to something real, that there were very practical steps that could be taken to contain Ebola. And then where the international community did make a difference, I think, was in two areas. The uh, testing of whether or not people had Ebola or whether they were actually suffering from another disease like malaria. Because at the beginning of the disease, it was four, five, six days before lab tests came in. By the end, it was three or four hours. And secondly, the, in the beginning of the disease, 70% of uh, spread was coming from dead bodies and the burial teams that went in to actually dispose of the bodies. It was a much more granular, practical level of engagement that, that made the difference. And so I think that we've got to beware the story that says it was a late response, but then the international community came in with secondary care that helped people survive. That wasn't our experience at all of the Ebola crisis. Uh, the, the, not to turn this into an Ebola conversation, but I would just, I, the point I was making about a difference in strategy is really about, you know, it echoes the HIV AIDS argument about is it medical or is it behavioral? Mm -hmm. And the public health community ha continues that debate around both issues. And so it's what strategy prevailed. I think the learnings out of Ebola will give us a different sense of what to, what to lean on hard when. Uh, but both, both were important and both contributed um, ultimately to the final resolution. Before turning this over to uh, uh, discussions with our uh, participant uh, uh, audience here, I want to ask, uh, get to two subjects. One is the SDGs and the other is conflict. So let me just start with the SDGs. So we had the, M you raised them, uh, Nancy. We have the, the MDGs, which are coming to their end of their life. Uh, there's been this massive effort to, you know, focus on the next challenge, and we have the SDGs coming up. There's a vast array of targets. Uh, will this represent uh, a, a significant pro, uh, advance in humanitarian uh, uh, thinking and action and development, uh, uh, un understanding and action of development? Uh, will the shift to the SDGs be a positive Here's what we've learned. We've now incorporated this in new goals that will create a positive framework for future action. Or is it just another sort of, uh, okay, this is done, now we go to another thing and no actual learning, no actual progress. Are people optimistic about the shift to the SDGs? Um, I, I think there's, uh, I, I think people have very different thermostats about the SDGs. Um, I think people widely recognize the opportunity at this moment in time to set a 15-year global development agenda that follows on from the MDGs, picks up the unfinished business, and uses the substantial accumulated evidence of the last generation really to think about smart development strategies that have enduring impact. I think people are excited about that opportunity. They will have very different views about the quality uh, uh, of, the, of the proposal on the table at the moment. What I will say about that, having been a bit involved with it in the generation of uh, of the proposal that's out there now. It, to me, is absolutely astonishing. I would never have guessed it two years ago when this started, that we would have gotten cross-regional, broad-based, international uh, agreement, broadly speaking, uh, to put governance and conflict at the center of this development agenda. It was very hard fought. There are still a multitude of sensitivities, but we have what many people know is now called Goal 16 in the proposal for 17 Sustainable Development Goals that not only puts peaceful and inclusive societies front and center as a development issue, it includes all the issues that we've all been talking about are relevant in that space that go to the development question. So the quality and inclusiveness of, uh, of institutions, the representativeness of decision making, uh, uh, corruption issues, uh, efficacy of basic service delivery, especially questions like access to justice. That's pretty powerful, and I want to say two things about how I think that principally came about. And it's not, again, comprehensively agreed, but it is broad-based, it is growing, and it is cross-regional. One was the leadership of countries for whom these are profound daily realities. So the leadership of uh, 
Timor-Leste, of Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guatemala, uh, a wide Nigeria, a wide spectrum of countries who would, are willing to say these issues are relevant to us as development matters, as daily bread and butter issues, it's got to be here, was enormously powerful. Uh, and second, evidence. I mean, I think we, you know, we all b benefited a lot from the, those of us who've been working in this field for uh, maybe too many years, the World Development Report in 2011 that took uh, a couple of decades of data about this, pulled it all into one place and very powerfully said, here's the authoritative evidence base about how conflict and fragility affects development. Um, and that, I think, is now has percolated through enough and then all of the follow-on work and, and updated uh, data and analytics um, that really helps make the case, uh, even where it's politically sensitive. So I think that's potentially very impactful. It leaves a lot of work to do in implementation, but is, uh, is extremely important. So is everybody as happy as Elizabeth about the uh, SDGs? <laughs> Optimistic. Uh, I'm not trying to be contrarian at all, I promise you. <laughs> um, I have two um, major concerns. One is that the scale of 17 goals and 169 targets, it's almost as if those who are doubtful about the capacity of the development or humanitarian sector to provide something practical have come up with their dream scorecard because trying to, I mean, if you think about even advanced industrialized countries running 17 goals and 169 targets is incredibly challenging if you've got the best government in the world. And so if you're talking about countries with fragile institutions, I have a fear that the, the infrastructure and the bureaucracy of just running something so complex is going to be really tough. Uh, secondly, I, I have a really serious concern about whether or not civilians in conflict are going to be helped by these goals and targets. And the, the, the fear is, is as follows, that across the 16 goals that are not the one dedicated to conflict, there's no specific mention in the targets of civilians in conflict zones. So if you look at the goal on um, women and girls, there's no mention of education for girls in conflict zones. There's no special mention of violence against women in conflict zones. And the rationale is that all of the targets are written in aspirational or quote-unquote inclusive terms. We want all children to get a good education. My fear, and this is born of experience in government, is that if you don't have a specific target about priority groups, then the bureaucracy doesn't follow them, that they get missed out, that there isn't the accountability in the middle and senior management for whether or not kids in conflict zones get an education. So 315,000 children, Syrian children in Lebanon today are not getting an education. Are they going to get closer because of the way the education goal is framed under the SDG? My fear is not. And on the conflict goal, I think Elizabeth has spoken really well about the way it's come about and it's been born of, of pressure. But the defensiveness of other countries has made the targets in goal 16 incredibly aspirational. So a fair uh, justice system is an incredibly long-term and aspirational goal. And for those civilians trapped in the 30 to 35 countries that are consumed by conflict, my fear is that it's going to seem incredibly removed from the reality that they're facing in the South Sudans or the Syrias of this world. And that lack of bite in the way that the targets are framed means that if you are, let, let's take the Nigerian example, if you're living under Boko Haram in the northeast of Nigeria, does the pledge to a fair justice system really speak to the life that you're living? My fear is that it doesn't. Without, and, hogging, without hogging the mic, what specifically could you, how would you have done things differently that would actually have been better? Well, I, I, look, 43% of the world's poor live in conflict states these days. So I would be saying, what are we trying to deliver for the 43% of the world's extreme poor who live in conflict states? And I would be saying, at a minimum, by 2025, you want 75% of kids in education. By 2030, you want 100% of kids in conflict zones in education. Uh, violence against women. I mean, it would be an extraordinary achievement simply to limit violence against women and girls to the levels that were pre-existing. Because in emergencies, our evidence is it triples. So even to limit the violence against women and girls to those pre-existing levels would, it, would itself have been important and would have put the focus on UN and other institutions on whether or not they're actually redesigning their services to meet those goals. So I would have been looking for much greater, or my fear is that the lack of precision is going to leave all of us who are arguing for the interests of these people, we're going to be arguing against a, a set of international bureaucracies that say, yeah, but we're, that's not what we're mandated to do. 
I, I do, and I know Elizabeth does as well. I, I would, you know, I think you raise really important points, David. Um, I would argue from a glass half full perspective that uh, to have gotten to this place where goal 16 was even included represents such a profound shift uh, of acknowledging that issues of justice and security and accountability are, are important and are central to moving forward the overall agenda towards peace and stability is, is groundbreaking. And it gives all of us an opportunity to, to build on that, to bring it forward. I'm sure a lot of the issues that you raised um, that Elizabeth can probably talk about fell out in the negotiating table, which was probably intense and complex. However, I believe that it gives us a, a really important opportunity to think about um, the ways in which justice and security are inextricably linked to the cessation of these spirals of conflict that we see so many of the countries that are in those 50-week conflict-affected states categories, that they get trapped because of the lack of that. And, you know, all of the um, leaders who I've talked to in the last few months here at USIP, coming from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Rwanda, from um, the countries that are grappling with conflict, they all talk about security and justice. And so if that isn't right in there, we don't have an opportunity of moving forward. All of, everything you're saying is absolutely right, but we need this goal, we need goal 16, as imperfect as it is, in order to advance on the overall agenda. And it's the opportunity to try to operationalize it in a useful and effective way that we all need to grasp. Yeah, I would, I mean, you're exactly right about the concerns. I think we, I mean, I think everybody operating in this space would share them. I think it's important to think about what this framework does and what it doesn't necessarily need to do in certain areas. I mean, to me, it's a starting point, it's not an end point. So the big question is, what do you do next? How do you think about implementation? How does the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, big donors, how do they think about uh, in practical terms, what they want to do with their own tools and instruments to be effective in these kind of contexts, whether it's Syria or someplace else. Um, I think that what you've sort of outlined in a way is is part of uh, how I would see the implementation agenda uh, with respect to this. And I, I think I'm, it's not clear to me that if you've had the year 2025 or an X percent thrown into a target, which is true, did, were the kinds of things that fell out in some of the negotiations, that that alone would have made the meaningful difference in Syria. It's what you do with that next. And so I think some of that can be built into the sort of actions and strategies that people take in thinking about implementation. But you're right to name the problem, and I think that's part of our collective challenge. It, it, look, we're on the same side on this, but let's admit to the audience, it's a, it's a huge struggle in the negotiations even to get tracking of the number of displaced people in different circumstances, even the, at the level of the indicators below the targets. Well, let, let's talk it's, about... It, it, there, there's enormous... It, it's a battle to get, to get recognition. Um, th this is an interesting one because there was a big debate about whether to have a target about internally displaced persons and my understanding, and you can tell me if this is correct or not correct, is that within the, broadly, uh, the broad humanitarian community there were really genuine differences about whether that would create perverse incentives about reporting, whether it was the right thing to count at all. It doesn't mean internal displacement isn't a huge issue, but is the right target to tackle it one about counting the number of them when there are so many exogenous factors that are hard to control. So it was a legitimate tough debate and I think there are a number of these issues that actually fall into that category where it's not just politics, it's actually tough calls. Okay. One last question on conflict before we turn it over to Q&A for the broader discussion. It, bringing high politics and war uh, back in, and uh, does does violence and war, whether interstate or, or civil, does that essentially clear the decks and make all the other kind of stuff uh, impossible? In other words, if you look at a, something like Syria where you know, you're going along and then the country descends into civil war, if you're not going to stop, if there's not going to be outside action uh, to be able to stop the war or to intervene, uh, you have to, have to sit by and watch hundreds of thousands of people die and millions uh, be displaced. Uh, and will, that, will war ultimately trump everything else on the humanitarian and development agenda if it can't be stopped. And if that is the case, uh, is, is sort of prevention uh, of conflict and, and negotiation and the settlement uh, the highest and most important aspect of this entire area? Well, I, 
Welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you for that <laughs> setup. I mean, and I just feel like you've given me too, too soft of a ball not to hit it. But, you know, having spent 20 years of, of my career working at that intersection of conflict, humanitarian assistance, development, uh, it, I think that if we don't tackle uh, how to manage conflict, and, and USIP really comes from the perspective of there will always be conflict, and the question is how do you manage it, and how do you help it become even potentially transformative instead of violent? Because once you become violent, once the conflict hits violence, you are on a backward trajectory. You are losing your development goals. You are losing lives. You are losing progress. And so it is, in, it, it is uh, the central mission of this institution, and I think um, critical for moving forward on any part of the, of the SDGs. If I could add to that, you still always have the component of people, uh, whether they're in conflict or, or not, and we still have to have programs that reach out to people. When you were talking about Lofa County in, in Liberia, and one of the elements of the success of Lofa County is that they knew IRC already before Ebola started. Uh, they had been in refugee camps and had been organized a long time before Ebola started. So they brought that experience to bear when they uh, started the process of dealing with Ebola. So we have to continue to work with people who are impacted by conflict so that when the conflict ends, or if it doesn't end, uh, that the people have the resilience to respond to whatever crisis that uh, they are presented with. And I think that was the case in, in LOFA. We have a whole lot of people here and a whole lot of subjects. Let's bring you guys into the conversation. Uh, who wants to, to ask our panelists something? And we come yes, over here. Well, hold on one second. Stand and state your name and wait for the microphone. My name is Rajput. Uh, I used to work at the World Bank, well, worked there for 33 years, and uh, now I'm with the School of Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Uh, I uh, do research on internally displaced uh, persons, IDPs. Uh, yes, IDP definitely has to be a component of, uh, of the new targets, because there are 33.3 uh, IDPs currently in the world, which has surpassed the number of refugees. And if we don't account for, uh, for the plight of the IDPs, I think it, uh, we are looking at uh, more conflict-induced displacement further on. Uh, because even when people are displaced due to natural disasters, uh, and they are, uh, they are not accounted for in, in one of the development indicators, the result is they, uh, they are further displaced. And uh, conflict-induced displacement is, is an indicator of a problem in a society. So we do have to, I mean, this is a very important thing. The IDPs have to be part of the, the policy governance. And usually I notice I, uh, I go to Kashmir and Georgia and Abkhazia, and I went to South Sudan, and I noticed that uh, hardly there are any policies because, you know, as it is, when you leave things, things to the government, I mean, sometimes things get, uh, you get by with very little because these are IDPs as opposed to refugees. So IDP is an important uh, uh, element of uh, one of the indicators to watch for. So another positive, uh, we should count IDPs. Uh, anybody else? Yes, in the back there. Ma'am. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm a president of a non-profit organization called Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts and violence prevention. I'm based here in Washington, D.C., but I come from Kenya. I uh, just wanted to comment on uh, collaboration. We have always a missing link here, collaboration between the government, the CPOs, international and local organizations. They don't collaborate. Nobody knows who is doing what. So without stopping conflicts and violence, there can be no development. People will rely on assistance because women can't go to the farm. They are raped. They can't go to fetch firewood. They'll, they'll be raped. So they stay in a fearful manner where there is no solution apart from getting assistance. So we should look into 
protection and prevention of violence and conflicts in these countries. As she has just mentioned, both those co in conflicts and violence go to the refugee camps. And the same refugee camps is where people like uh, Boko Haram, extremists and other people come from to terrorize people. So how do we solve this situation? We need that collaboration, coordination and information sharing. So please let it be a stop of conflicts and violence, peace and security, especially in Africa where we come from in Congo, you have seen and heard what happens there. So this is very, very important. Conflicts and violence should be stopped first before we get into actual development because there will be a problem still even if there is still violence, conflicts. So thank you so much. And how do we collaborate with the government, local and international? Uh, Farooq Athwari. My question to the panelists is that they, they, they mentioned that conflict is one of the major challenges in terms of peace and development. Leadership shapes the debate. Leadership is the one which has got to set the agenda of how to end it or, had to re or at least uh, uh, alleviate the problems. The leaders of the world are the major countries, United States and others. When we take a look at the five permanent members of the Security Council, I think they produce, they provide 70, 80 percent of all the arms that are used in the conflict. So my question is, what can be done with the leaders which are shaping the debate and what kind of question, conflict they have, whether it is the question of providing armament or the question of raw materials and oil that is also help shaping the debate and perhaps fueling further conflict. What can you do to shape your leaders? <laughs> being one of them, uh, uh, I say my response to your question is you have the voices to shape uh, positions in leadership. I'm constantly asked by the NGO community, by civil society, what we can do uh, to, to help them. And my response has been we need your voices to help us. We need your voices to shape our policy. Uh, we need your voices to complain about our policies. Um, I regularly get hundreds of emails from civil society on policies. And uh, they shut down the system occasionally. But they make a difference. And I'm not asking you all to send uh, hundreds of emails to, uh, to me in particular, uh, but to any of us. But uh, your advocacy, your raising your voices uh, to say, you know, what are you doing to stop the spread of arms in, in the world? Uh, and putting those statistics in our faces, I think, really will make a difference in, in terms of policy. David, do you have a different perspective on leadership as the head of uh, IRC than you did as foreign minister? Yeah, I mean, I'd say two things. One, it's very striking if you think about the last hour of discussion that almost every paragraph has involved the interplay of humanitarian or development effort and politics. Far from these two spheres living in, in different boxes, what's come through all of the contributions is the, is the interplay. Now, the humanitarian sector for 150 years has defined itself separate from politics for all sorts of good reasons. Independence, neutrality, impartiality, humanity, those are very, very important principles. And in a way, that separation from politics is, is, is some of the best defense for our staff around the world from people who would do them ill. Having said that, all of the comments have been about the limits of the humanitarian sector unless it recognizes its engagement with small p politics, if not large p politics. So that's my first um, reflection. The second reflection is that everything that, I, that we ha has been said notably about the importance of being long-termist, about the importance of proper risk assessment, about the importance of avoiding fragmentation, are in a way being said without calling out the elephant in the room, which is that all governments, including this country, face political systems where the pressure is for fragmentation and short-termism. I mean, I've been very, very... And some of the legal limits on what, for example, US funds can be used for provide a very strict set of rules uh, that, I would argue, limit 
your ability to take forward some of your humanitarian, never mind political objectives. The rules that now exist limiting where US diplomats, the, duty of, the way the duty of care to US diplomats is interpreted limits very severely the extent to which US diplomats can get out into the societies in which they are representing the country. And I think that it's worth trying to think through what it would mean for a donor community to establish leadership positions. It means pushing against the kind of fragmentation, short-termism, and, and limitations that I'm afraid are encumbering the effectiveness of, of policy making at the moment. Okay, I'm gonna uh, bring in a question here from Twitter since we're nothing if not 21st century. Uh, so this is from uh, Paul Vandenberg. Uh, by the way, the hashtag is Hashtag fragility nexus. A uh, uh, question from Twitter. So what do you think about, what does the panel think about the proposal to dedicate half of ODA to conflict affected and fragile areas in order for these areas to reach the SDGs? Well, about 30% already goes to those countries. And in my mind, it's less a matter of how much, but what it's doing. And it gets, I think, very much to some of the issues that David just brought up in terms of Making, making it more focused on addressing the risks in those countries, whether the risks are from natural disaster or from political failure or from corruption. It's targeting it so that whatever advances you make have a better chance of being sustained. Okay. Can I respond to that as well? I think if we make the mistake of focusing uh, too much attention away from those countries that are not categorized as fragile, we stand the chance of having the other countries fall into that fragile category. So I think it's really important that we not ignore countries that may be one step above fragile or even five steps above fragile so that they don't fall down and become uh, fragile states that require uh, our attention. So I think we have to look more broadly at uh, our assistance to ensure that we don't lose those countries that might be moving forward. So we need an earned income tax credit for countries as well as people. Can I just add sure. one, one, one point on this? Because uh, I think it's important to reinforce that at the absolute center of this conversation about the next generation of development goals is the commitment to eradicate extreme poverty. Extreme poverty is manifest in, in places. It is disproportionately and increasingly manifest in the kind of context that we're talking about now. So without having to put numerical uh, thresholds uh, and categorize country X versus country Y, simply by being committed to eradicating extreme poverty as a matter of priority, which President Obama a few years ago made a, a, a commitment to, um, that alone captures what we're talking about. And if you marry that to some of the how questions, how you deliver assistance, where you target assistance that Nancy and, and, and the rest of the panel have been, been raising, I think then you really have some, some, some mileage. Okay. A uh, couple of questions here. To you. And then I'll bundle two of them together. We'll bundle two of them together. Um, thank you very much. Mark Schneider, International Crisis Group. Um, and I appreciate all of the comments from the panel. I would raise one issue which hasn't really been discussed. There are those who benefit from fragility, and there are those who benefit from conflict. And when you look at what do you do to prevent conflict, and what do you do in post-conflict situations, I do think that the point that was raised about the importance of rule of law, law enforcement, and the capacity to make citizens believe that their governments are going to respond to their needs more effectively is critical. And, and when you go back to Paul Collier's studies, both in terms of conflict prevention and post-conflict reconstruction, if you don't focus more attention on building effective legal systems, legal systems that really on the criminal side, it seems to me that you have a fundamental problem in getting to your next goals uh, in, in those countries that are already in conflict and those countries that might fall into conflict. Okay. And, uh, over here. All in goal 16, Mark. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathleen Newland from the Migration Policy Institute and an IRC overseer. Uh, a lot of the criticism of the humanitarian community and the development community has, has been, uh, as I think you mentioned, Nancy, that, they remain, that they're not building the capacity of lo the state locally and society locally. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the things that IRC has done really well in, in, uh, in its field work is 
training and relying on and giving leadership positions to locally recruited people who then, in many cases, go on to take positions in government or in, in uh, humanitarian organizations. It's not so clear to me that that is sort of built in to governmental uh, development and humanitarian programs, and I wondered if, if uh, Linda or Elizabeth could, could comment on whether that is in some way a priority for how we uh, address fragility in these states. It certainly should be a priority, and again, my comments about IRC in, in Lofa County, where you built capacity, and so even though you were not there, the people you trained and, and put into place were there. Um, and this is a complaint that we hear regularly about governments, that we bring in our humanitarian and our development programs, uh, and their assessment, right or wrong, is that it's about uh, providing salaries to Americans and not building the capacity of communities to take over uh, the responsibility. So I think it is a key uh, consideration for how we do development in the future, that we must leave infrastructure and capacity to continue when we're gone. Just to add to that, I mean, one of the, one of the most um, important uh, contributions, I would argue, of, of the NGO sector is that it is increasingly multi-mandate so that it does not just humanitarian but development and kind of all, you know, it erases some of those sometimes artificial stovepipes and has a, an enduring and longer term relationship with communities, uh, societies, countries on the ground. I mean, very much what the IRC does. Um, that is uh, an, a, an invaluable part of the overall system because of the ways that there is that information, the capacity, and, and all of the positive outcomes. The biggest challenge that, that I've seen through the years for the NGO community is that it is less able to deliver aggravated, uh, aggregated understandings of impact. So that the more the NGO community can find a way to understand the collective impact in a given country or region, the more uh, useful that will be to understand what is the difference that we are collectively making. Because I believe that the NGOs are doing just extraordinary work. It's just harder to understand that impact because it is so atomized group by group. Perhaps what we need is more uh, aggravated understanding. Uh, this, is a, aggravated. Uh, <laughs> so this is a question from Twitter. Another question from Twitter. It's from the World Food Program's Erin Cochran. Um, uh, she wants to know what the panel sees as the impact of food insecurity on conflict and violent extremism. And I guess I would add to that uh, also uh, climate. Are we seeing these an increase in stressors uh, that are making all the various problems uh, that we're talking about here worse rather than better and our things are going to get even worse because of food insecurity, climate change and other kinds of natural issues over the years? Uh, so I, I think they are increasingly linked. Uh, climate related disasters and food insecurity, we're seeing that with the increased prevalence of drought uh, and what that does in terms of um, creating displacement, um, putting the most vulnerable into chronic cycles of crisis. And it also has profound economic impact on a, con on a country. So at every level, from the household up to the country, up to the region, uh, when you have these continual and often chronic cycles of food insecurity, uh, there are devastating results. In, in Kenya, uh, what was uh, considered to be a very marginalized part of the country, the herders in the, in the arid drylands, oh, never mind, we won't invest in them. That 2011 drought cost Kenya uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $13 billion over a two-year period. So f food insecurity is, is, is critical to grapple with as a part of the overall development package, and it's linked, of course, to poverty and hunger, all the fundamental goals. Uh, yes, right here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> uh, I'm Mary Boys, and today I'm here in a capacity as an IRC board member. 
uh, the title of this panel is Fragility, Conflict, and Humanitarianism. I'd be interested to hear from the panel your favorite examples, if there are any, of successes in this space and what you, whether those successes for you create a kind of template or model for what might work in those spaces and whether you agree with each other as to those successes. Um, it's not just for me, but I'm happy to um, kick off. Look, every day I learn about some absolutely inspiring example of what my own organization is doing uh, around the world, and sometimes I even read about inspiring things that other organizations are doing. So broad, so broad-minded am I. Um, look, what are the things that uh, stick in uh, my head? One, it's the interventions that combine economic and social intervention. We've had very little discussion today about what's the role of economic growth in the private sector, and my engagement on the question. Do you remember there was an earlier question about what about the non-fragile states? And the point about the non-fragile states is it's much easier to have economic activity in those states and that's going to make a bigger difference than international aid in those states. But so my favorite example is the water project in uh, the Somalia region of Ethiopia that had an economic as well as a social intervention and that was sustainable and run by the local community. So that's the second point. The second thing that inspires me is when it's local people who are taking leadership positions. And so what's in my head, an extraordinary um, women's um, reproductive health program in the Fatah region of uh, Pakistan, which is an incredibly difficult place to work, but one which nonetheless is empowering women to lead change in their own community in a way that is culturally sensitive and recognizing uh, local need. The third point I'd make, just, just to, to finish off, is that we've had no mention today of non-state actors. But increasingly, our world, at least the world of a humanitarian organization, is defined not just by states and international organizations, but it's defined by non-state actors. So my third uh, example of what impresses me is the staff who insisted on continuing to run primary care center in areas where ISIS were in control. Now, uh, I'm not going to say much more about it, but for a long time, very significant uh, work was being done in very difficult circumstances. And what is the, when I spoke to the team there, how was that being, how was that safe? It was safe because these were local community members. It speaks directly to Linda's uh, point and to one of the earlier questions, which is that if it's, if, it's an, if it's an international project or an American project, it's much less sustainable than if it's a local project. And to be a local project, it's got to be run by local uh, people. So those are the kind of things that speak to, speak to me and speak to the, the needs of the moment. Because the challenges we're facing are not just increasing numbers of people who are in humanitarian need. It's that the circumstances in which they're working, in which they're living, are different from those before. They're caused by different factors, including the climate and related factors. And unless we change the way we operate to recognize those changed circumstances, we're not going to be able to make the kind of difference that we want to. I'd like to use a political example, and, and, and that's Nigeria. Uh, and that, uh, the recent election, where it was very clear that the people of Nigeria wanted to have a successful election. Uh, we had a country with uh, 120,000 polling stations. There's no way the international community and observers from around the world could have gone into those polling stations in the far-flung uh, areas of, of Nigeria to provide the kind of, uh, of election monitoring that was required. So it was local organizations with support uh, by all of us, but basically local organizations and local people, uh, more than 3,000 trained, who were committed to making sure that Nigeria had a successful election. And we're seeing the fruits of that uh, today, that they were able to vote out a ruling party, which is an unusual uh, event on the continent of Africa. We have, uh, actually, the next row back, we have a couple right here. Yes, you? You need a mic over right here? Sorry, Jill, one second. She was Hi, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. We heard about the impact of arms and arms shipments, and the larger question behind that is the inequities in the economic options available to developing countries. I don't need to cite chapter and verse, mining companies coming in. Uh, Myanmar is a great example. Folks from China trying to develop mineral resources, people being paid inequitably, resources being exploited 
one needs to talk about the most macro of macro issues, how economic distortions are engines for conflict sooner or later. Comments welcome. Uh, actually, Ambassador, uh, let me get you in on that because what David said about what David said about the intersection of economic issues and development with um, uh, some of the other issues. Uh, here we have a question about economic distortions and outside actors and, and disparities. We also have, I mean, you, with the Africa Leaders Summit this past year and with the focus and attention on the positive growth stories and developments in Africa and many of these countries uh, now, uh, the, the question of the intersection of private sector uh, and uh, NGO and government sector, uh, uh, is the private sector a force for good or is it a force for bad? Uh, is it, uh, what is the, uh, how, do, how do all these things link up with private sector development? I think we all clearly uh, would agree that uh, the engine of change in any country in terms of investment and development and job creation, uh, that's going to come from the private sector. So the private sector must be a force for good. Is it always a force for good? That's, that's the question that I think I'm being asked. And clearly that is not always the case. And this is where strong governments that have uh, strong policies that monitor what uh, uh, organizations and, and businesses uh, are doing in their country, where, where that comes into play. And where we play a role is in helping these countries build their capacity to oversee what is being done in their countries, uh, to ensure that what is being done is in the best interest of their people, uh, to ensure that companies are creating jobs, not importing, uh, importing people to, to do the jobs. Uh, and this is a message that we regularly uh, discuss uh, with our counterparts in, in Africa. Some countries get it, uh, and some are yet to get it, but I think we have to continue to push it. Thank you. My name is Gulcheen Akil. I'm from Pakistan. I'm a Humphrey Fellow uh, in US. Uh, I had been working for gender and development in Pakistan and South Asia for quite a some time, mostly with INGOs and UN system. I have two questions or concerns. Uh, why there is less emphasis on gender nowadays? Because we feel it's disappearing. There was emphasis, I mean, although uh, some of the respected panelists mentioned it, um, I think we need to have it, especially when we are talking about fragility and uh, humanitarian assistance or humanitarian programs, because we cannot have a sustainable state, resilience, or all these dreams that we wish for until unless we ensure women, young girls are part of it. My second concern is about the politicization of uh, humanitarian aid, or I would say the health services, especially in Pakistan, I would say, I'm sure you're familiar with um, uh, polio campaigns. I think we need to have a clear policy to separate these two things because uh, as a Pakistani, I mean, I see there are very long-term <laughs> impacts on health services and especially polio-like campaigns, they are affected. So what is uh, the stance of respected panelists? I want to know that. Thank you. I, I'm sure everyone has a comment on that. On the, on the first, I mean, absolutely. And there are two goals in the SDGs that are specific to women. And goal 16 talks, uses the word inclusive, I think, several times. It is, I mean, it, it's absolutely critical that we think about gender and that we include women. Um, and I'm happy we have Ambassador uh, Kathy Russell with us here from the State Department who's uh, Help it, helps us all remember that, but uh, that is with it, it's fundamentally the case. On the polio example, I think that's less. First of all, there are clear policies about that, and that was violated. And I also believe that that's not a, a, a case of politicizing aid. It's a case of making a decision that jeopardized the future of the humanitarian efforts, especially around polio. And, and it continues to plague Pakistan, you're absolutely right. 
Can I just jump in on, on gender, just in the context of the next generation of development goals? Um, exactly as Nancy said, there is one very robust standalone goal on gender. It's goal five, and it includes very specific uh, and very hard issues. Women's economic empowerment, equal political participation, violence against women, uh, sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. It's a very strong agenda. And there are also uh, uh, targets throughout the rest of the, uh, uh, of the proposal. What I would also, though, underscore is not there's, there's the talk about inclusion, but there is also consistently a very strong, uh, there's a lot of conversation about the need for data, but especially for the need to disaggregate data and particularly around gender, so that you are able to count girls and women, you're able to see where they're being left behind, and you're able to target assistance and support accordingly. So I think that's another reason to have uh, a bit of confidence, at least in that part of, part of the agenda. We need to get your mic. Sarah O'Hagan, IRC co-chair. I want to, at the risk of opening a forceful conversation like the Ebola one, turn us to the question of education for Syrian refugees. Because it strikes me that um, this is a classic example of where the humanitarian and development paradigm clash is most acute. And I really just want to ask baldly, does it expose the fact that we can't mobilize to solve a, a, a situation like this, even though it really poses a price that no one of the receiving countries wants to pay a generation from now? Um, well, uh, I think it is worth pausing for a moment on the Syria crisis, because in a way it's the defining crisis of our time. Uh, uh, extraordinary um, scale of need, four million refugees. I, I went to the Tenement Museum in New York last Monday on Memorial Day, and this wide-eyed um, guide, um, uh, she was a young woman, she must have been 28, she was a fantastic explanation of uh, the influx of refugees into New York between 1880 and 1920, and she said, do you know that between, in that 40-year period, two and a half million people arrived in New York, such a small place as New York, 40 years, and they were integrated into the local community? And going through my head was that in four years, Lebanon has taken 1.8 million refugees, Jordan has taken 1.2 million refugees, Turkey has taken 2 million refugees, Iraq has got 600,000 refugees, and those are uh, societies that are creaking under the pressure. And I think Sarah's challenge on education is a really profound one. And I mentioned the 315,000 Syrian kids in Lebanon who are not getting an education. Why aren't they? The Lebanese government blames the international system for not funding it. The international system blames the Lebanese government for not organizing it. NGOs like ours say, in all the talk about state systems, there's a terrible neglect of what we would call community-based complementary education. We've put our own money into helping organize education for 5,000 uh, Syrian kids. But the truth is that the system is failing those children and failing that society. Because as you say, a decade of no education for those uh, kids is an absolute, it's not just a moral disaster, it's an instrumental disaster for those uh, countries. And, and I think it's a, a challenge that's very well put. My own answer would, I mean, just for context, 80% of Lebanese parents don't send their own kids to Lebanese schools. So you've got a real issue inside the mainstream education system, which to me emphasizes the need for that complementary community-based education. But in, a, in an international system that's very focused on state-centric solutions, there's a terrible neglect, I would argue, of community-based solutions. And I, I think that's one of the, the lessons. And frankly, there's not going to be a transformation unless there's a different kind of partnership between state-based interventions and community-based interventions, certainly in the education space. I, I would just add that you know, there has been a significant effort to mobilize specifically around the education of Syrian refugees, called, or, or Syrians both inside and outside of Syria, called No Child Left Behind that did mobilize a significant amount of funding. There has also been, uh, from the humanitarian side, there's also been a lot of development assistance, especially from the US government in Lebanon and Jordan in particular. I, I, think, I think the issues are, number one, the scale of all of the needs overwhelm what we're able to do as the international community. I mean, just the, you know, every sector is underfunded and overwhelmed. Secondly, I. Th I've seen both Jordan and, and, and Lebanon stretch on their policies. They have let Syrians into the schools in Jordan, for example. 
Uh, they have tried hard. There are curriculum concerns, though. Syri some of the Syrian families don't want their kids going through that system. So th that's another, but they are, they're double shifting. It's had enormous impact well beyond what I can imagine happening in the United States ever in terms of letting refugee kids into our schools at that scale and that, at that number. Um, I, I think you raise a really important point, David, about being more open to some of these other kind of community-based solutions that are outside the former school system. Um, it, I, I think, ultimately comes down to we are overwhelmed by the scale of the need and the funds that are going out for this crisis can't possibly meet everything that's required. And what it fundamentally gets to is when you have a, a conflict of that magnitude that has metastasized into a regional conflict with global impact, every single system is overwhelmed. And it, it, it goes to what happens when you have unchecked conflict. If I could just add bringing in the Africa perspective. I think what we've learned over many years is that refugee crises are not temporary. And I think the approach to long-term development, uh, such as education, was that this was long-term and refugees were temporary and we're not going to put funding into a temporary situation. When we look at the Somalia uh, case, uh, particularly at Dadaab refugee camp, where we've had refugees there for 20 years. We're into the second generation there. We have to provide education. When Secretary Kerry was in Kenya a few weeks ago, he actually talked to refugees who were in uh, high schools, uh, and they were quite impressive. And I think that just supports the case that we have to provide education. Uh, we have to prepare these young people for the future. If we don't prepare them for the future, they become easy, easy targets uh, for uh, terrorists uh, uh, who are trying to bring them into their philosophical uh, uh, sphere, and they become, uh, they become our next generation of terrorists. Uh, we have to provide them with a understanding that they have a future, and, that, and we have to invest in that future. Can I just come back on this? Because I think it Quick. is important. You see, I don't think we can just say it's, um, we're overwhelmed. Because uh, the truth is that it's very, very hard to figure out what's the political solution to the Syrian crisis. Very, very hard. In the scale of things, it's not very hard to organize education for kids. Right? It's not reasonable to say that because we haven't got a political solution in Syria, we can't make more of a difference for Lebanese, for, for kids in Lebanon. And it's true that the societies there have been extraordinary. And it's true that there's double shifts and 20% of the Syrian kids who've gone to Lebanon are in school. But four years into the crisis, 315,000 of them aren't. And what I don't understand is, is the following point. If I was in politics still, and I was very leery of any kind of military engagement on the Syrian conflict, if I, if, I, if I didn't want to go down that route, I would be making the humanitarian effort in the neighboring states, who after all, in Jordan's case, is a very close ally of the United States, I would be making that humanitarian case my absolute driver. And there are all sorts of reasons for why the US and other countries will be very leery of getting stuck into the middle of the military conflict in Syria. I'm not trying to drag us into that, but in that circumstance, where frankly there's no prospect of the war ending anytime soon, I just don't understand why and how there isn't much, much, much greater strategic instrumental priority to those needs in the neighboring states, because that's the easy end of the policy. The very, very hard end is in the middle of the conflict, but Lebanon, Jordan, these are the countries not consumed by conflict. And so I think that there is a, that there, that there's, that there's a mismatch between the strategic imperative that the ambassador has just laid out very, very lucidly and powerfully, and what frankly is an effort at the moment that looks marginal to the scale of the problem. So we're, we're going to wrap this up, even though we have so many questions and so many uh, things we could discuss, we just need to keep it uh, on time. But let me, let me just close by asking you guys a, a, a personal question. I mean, and I think it's a good follow-on to, uh, to that issue, David, which is, I mean, in many respects, as we all knew would be the case, the, the issues we're discussing are so depressing and the scale of the problems is so great and the mismatch between the solutions and uh, the, the need uh, is so huge. 
you guys spend your lives grappling with these questions and trying to be uh, positive change agents and do a little better and organize uh, constructive solutions. As you realize more than anybody else, just sort of the mismatch between the solutions available and the, the need, um, how do you keep, what keeps you going? What is it that gives you hope that things can get better? What is it that, uh, that, that doesn't lead you to be sort of just overwhelmed and depressed? I'll start. Uh, I, I think for me, for Africa, it's the young people in Africa. Uh, as you know, uh, President Obama launched the Young African Leaders Initiative and we brought 500 extraordinarily uh, talented and ambitious young people to Washington, to the United States last year. The second cohort of that group is coming on their way now to the United States. And when you talk to these young people, they are sharp. Uh, they are ambitious. They understand what is happening around them and they want to, uh, they want to change. They want to make change. They want to be engines of change. They need the resources. They need the mentoring. Uh, they need the support uh, of everybody, not just their government and people, but also uh, other countries and partners to share their vision and push forward uh, their vision uh, along with them. And I think every time I meet these young people, listening at young people in a refugee camp in Kenya and have one young person say, I want to be a mathematician, uh, I want to be a doctor, uh, I want to be a scientist, and they're living in a refugee camp, uh, if that does not give you hope, nothing else will give you hope for the continent of Africa. So our challenge is to figure out how to support these young people in the case of Africa, 60, 70 percent under the age of 30, how to give them uh, the will to, to move forward and how to give them a vested interest in the future of their country is a challenge that we all face and that we all have to deliver on. Jump in. I, I feel like I have had an extraordinary privilege in being able to spend most of my life living, or much of many years of my life, living in other countries uh, and living often with people who are uh, enduring very difficult um, and challenging circumstances. And I have been so utterly humbled, but also inspired by seeing daily bravery, daily innovation, and it's everyone from the people you're living with in the community, uh, the peacekeepers, the mediators, the aid workers, um, such extraordinary commitment um, that even when there are many solutions that are elusive. I'm not convinced they're not out there. We can always do better. You can often see the pathways to doing that. And to me, that gets me up every day to want to make, uh, make change and put energy into exactly those kinds of things. Well, David, I'll let you have the last word. And, and I, I, I would, without question, it's the people that you meet. And um, be seeing how people not just endure, but continue to find joy in the midst of crisis and, and to reach out and be a part of something bigger than themselves that I also find really humbling and, and inspiring. And I also think that if you look at the trajectory of where we've come as a planet, that actually the trend lines are pretty positive in a lot of dimensions. And so, you know, I am an internal optimist and, and I find a lot of what we've just discussed today in terms of uh, reframing some of the issue sets and how to mobilize our collective energy to make a push on the next round is very exciting and gives us great, great uh, cause for optimism. Great answers from my co-panelists. I would say that we're not the heroes of this. We're in, I, I, I never say politics is secure, but reasonably secure, well-paid jobs and the people who are in the front line are the real heroes and they are the ones who offer inspiration. But I think to pick up something that all have said so far, the resources for making a difference are greater than ever before. And so uh, the danger is not, frustration, is not to depression, the danger is frustration. That at a time of greater resources to make a more of a difference, we're not making more of a difference. And I think that's what inspires people to action and always has across the ages. The, the great Jewish sage Rabbi Tarfan is quoted as saying uh, that we're not at liberty to, uh, we're not expected to finish the task of repairing the world, but we're also not allowed uh, to abandon it. And I think that's uh, uh, the right mindset, which is the, this is going to be an ongoing challenge and uh, 
Uh, I want to thank all of you, not just for the work you do, but for this fabulous panel. Uh, clearly, there is uh, going to be a need for more of these panels uh, every, every few years for as far as the eye can see, uh, and as long as the USIP will have us and sponsor us. Uh, and until then, thank you and thank all of you.